So a lot of people have asked me how I set up my website and how I'm drawing so much traffic. I, I actually have more than 100,000 users per month coming to my website. And a lot of my videos have website guides attached to them. And I also embed these videos. If you only want to see me over on my website, you can. I do RSS feeds. I do automatic publication. I do a full commenting system that uses GitHub issues. I have a whole bunch of stuff that, frankly, I set up all myself, which is awesome. On top of that, you might be thinking, how do you even have time to do all this? Like you make three YouTube videos a week with accompanying articles, and then you have a day job still, and you also code where you might spend three hours per day coding. And the website is the pinnacle of all this. This is where I draw most of my workflow and how I've been able to optimize and get better and more efficient and more productive. So obviously I have a lot of good things to say about this, but it's not for everybody. You know, it's very heavy in Markdown, so it's something you need to get used to. But once you do, you will be a productivity god. So let's get on the desktop and, and look at this. First up, uh, of course, I made an article about the articles that I make on my website. And, uh, I, and this is completely free as well. The one thing I didn't mention in that intro is I, don't, I didn't pay anything until I literally broke 100,000 users and I was using over 100 gigs of uh, bandwidth per month, which is a lot of bandwidth considering most of my images from the home here. These are like 10 kilobits. These are optimized, web optimized images. So I don't really use much of anything when it comes to a bandwidth usage. So we're going to make a practice article right now. And to do that, it's pretty darn simple. It's just Hugo, new, posts. I usually categorize everything by year because I make a lot of articles. And then I'll usually make a practice article. Like Xanmod, Markdown is a practice article we're going to make really fast. Oh, or we could make another practice article. Let's let's call this one static ETH dot markdown. If I was going to show you how to do a static IP address on like Debian. Uh, and then all I do is just edit that. So from here, I'll do fuzzy find editor, grab that static ETH markdown file, and you'll see this is all made for me. So the title, uh, let's let's just change the title real fast and we'll just call this how to create a static IP and I'm going to do just Linux on this. So we'll delete those. Uh, we'll make this for Debian Linux. Uh, you can put any corresponding tags like let's say this might be networking as well. So that's actually I have a networking category. There's two types of different categories. You can break this down. Actually, three types. There's categories, tags and series. So you can actually really have some amazing taxonomies if you're into that. But typically I just use categories and tags. Tags just kind of give you more description. Categories is more broad where I might only have like six or seven categories, but I might have upwards of 100 or 200 tags on the website at any given time. And that just makes it to where you click like a Debian tag. It'll just show specifically Debian articles that have been tagged. And then I have the very intro here. Obviously I'm not gonna do a draft. Uh, as most times I publish in the future. So let's say I was making an article about this and I wanted to publish this on 1030. This shows you how to create a static IP in Linux. Now, if I tweeted out these instructions or I reference this article anyways, I typically would just throw the tweet ID so it would just embed nicely in here. And then you have that nice circular flow uh, between Twitter and, and your website for traffic. For the YouTube video, when I go to publish it, I usually just change the ones. I come over here and delete that. And then I would put the entire ID of this video. So obviously I don't have that. We'll just undo it. So then you just do like the how to do a, an IP address. And then you just set the static or, or let's say we do a DHCP. That's probably a little bit easier. Check your interfaces, do like a code with just a back tick and just say IPA. Or if I wanted to do like a copy paste code, like this would just give it like a uh, very thing or use code blocks for like a copy paste selection. So we do three back ticks. IPA, and I'll just show you the different formatting that that gives. Uh, but it it's almost looks like I've like copy pasted an entire thing and spent a lot of time on. And if you were doing this in like WordPress or Squarespace and all these word web editors, you'd have to like click the code block. And, and it's just 
a bit cumbersome and slow in my opinion. That and just previewing it can be kind of a bummer. And then you need to like edit the ETC interfaces file. And for here, I could just grab my, uh, let's, let's just retrieve, we'll cat the ETC network interfaces file. And this kind of shows you everything I'm doing with my interfaces, which uh, frankly, we don't need any of that. Mm, let's just delete these eight lines and we'll remove that and just kind of show people, hey, this is how you would issue a, a DHCP address to this specific thing. But those back ticks are super important. You see how the formatting is all jacked up. We could fix that formatting by those backtick files. So we've got like a sample article. We've spent maybe a minute or two on it. Nothing too bad. Let's uh, just do a Hugo server real fast. We actually have it running. It's actually building live. So as we edit with this Hugo server going, let's go back to our home and you'll see how to create a static IP. This is everything we just did, spending about a minute doing it. You can add specific uh, images in here. Again, just using simple markdown. So if we come into here, pull up static ETH again, and let's say we want to come down to here and I'll just grab like a sample file. And usually that starts with an exclamation mark. And we'll just say, let, I have no Xanmod background sitting in my uh, content. So we'll just do images 2022 and then Xanmod.png. That should, uh, should do it. Let's see. Yeah. Then it pulls that picture in. Uh, some people are like, well, that's way harder to memorize than just hitting insert from a web interface. I would say it just takes some time to getting used to. So usually when I'm thinking up articles or those types of things, I am just grabbing all of the images and things I know I need to show the user that might read the article, tossing those in its own independent directory, and then just referencing that one file. And I say, okay, I'm going to put this there and I usually add my images and then I write all my text afterwards to kind of fill it all in and kind of put meat on the bones, so to speak. Basically how you'd make an article and uh, frankly, we don't need that article. So let's just go ahead and delete it and I'll just grab all of that. Say yes. And guess what? This will just disappear. So let's reload and that article's done. Everything is uh, in live. So as you're editing, you could actually change uh, everything. So if you want to change the title, it will auto update throughout site wide and you can see your edits as it gets saved. So let's say in my website, let's uh, vim into that and we'll just do how I set up my website in my short code. Let's say I wanted to add something towards the top and we're just going to add some text. So right here, we'll just do test and let's say put that out and then you see the test right there. Let's delete that one line and you see it auto refreshes as you do it. Or let's say we want to throw that Xan mod kernel right in here. So we could just put that whole image like this and we could create like hotkeys and things to paste it in there. Or if you're using VS code, whatever it is, you could, you could have all this in a shortcut type key. But uh, for now, let's just do xanmod.png and that looks good. And then we'd have the image in there but we don't need that, so we'll get rid of it. You got this nice way to edit pages really, really quickly. There's no saving, waiting for the refresh. Okay, let me check the live page. And then when you're done, let's say you're done with this and you're like, okay, everything here looks good. Uh, then we would just do a git commit and push. Or if you set up a little hot key for that, you could do a lazy G test commit and push. And then it would push out to the GitHub. It would sit on that website GitHub. Netlify would then see it, which that's the next piece of the puzzle. If you go to netlify.com, it would automatically see it and start building this. Let me log in real fast. And you can see right here, this is actually uh, getting pushed and you can actually roll back your website. So let's say it's a bad, bad publish and it ends up mess messing up my website as it's uh, building and processing. You're like, oh no, what did I do? That's terrible. The only downside to using this thing is you need to do scheduled builds, which you can actually just type in. There, there's an actual webhook with an API, and you can just put that on a GitHub action, or if you have a secondary server somewhere sitting, not being used, you just add a cron job to just schedule it at 8 a.m. or whatever time you want to schedule your publishes, and it would just do it, which is great. So that's the beauty of this. And honestly, if you mess something up, coming back into like this one, 
Okay, let's let's publish this deploy instead. That was a bad deploy. You can go back and forth on all these, which again, kind of amazing. Now to do this for you and starting out, I have some some tips. The first bit is the setup. I highly recommend Nix Package Manager. I covered that in a prior video. Installing Hugo if you're using Linux. If you're using Mac OS, Homebrew has Hugo. If you're using Windows, WinGit also has Hugo. So just install Hugo and then you can just drop and do all the things I did. There's a one line to create a new site using Hugo new site. And then you want to populate it with a theme. I highly recommend checking out this, the Zizo theme. It's made by a very gifted South Korean programmer. I highly recommend his stuff. He has an amazing documentation page right here, which again, kind of cool. Like his last commit was a little bit ago, but I recommend starting with this theme just because it kind of explains a lot more uh, in depth for the basics. And then when you want to do more customization, I, I made an article about that. Back on this little cheat sheet, you can see towards the bottom, we have the Hugo guide. And this shows a little bit more advanced, like HTML. Let's say there's something in that theme that you want to change. You could actually go through and, and really add a lot of HTML. Let's say you want to do like an ad right here for AdSense. You could just toss that right here. And like, let's let's remove that. You can see I only do one ad on my website just to kind of pay for uh, NetLefeasance. It's $19 a month. And usually I'll get 19 bucks from just a one sidebar ad. Um, actually, I think it's like a hundred bucks for one sidebar ad because of how much traffic I get, which is awesome. So this is really neat. The other thing I'll warn you about when starting a uh, Hugo is don't directly edit in the theme file itself. Make your own layout partials in the root directory. So when you look at the structure, uh, and I'm going to actually pull up the structure through VS code, you can see kind of my structure. Now, obviously I've been making content for a long time, but you have archetypes. This is actually the default. This is the template it grabs when you go new post. Well, everything's pulled from here, which is kind of amazing. Content is where all of your content lives. So when you're creating content, it's all in here. Public, this gets auto-generated. You never have to edit anything in here. This just pops up. And this is what Netlify uses to push your website out. Resources, I don't really use static. These are static files. So if I have like a logo, or something like that, that I always want someone to go christitis.com forward slash logo.png, I could put it in here. Or maybe there's a file, like I have a registry entry here that I couldn't host anywhere. Uh, I could put that right here as well. And then you could just type that in and grab those files from any web page. And then the meat and potatoes is the theme uh, with the Zizo theme. This is actually a paid theme that I really kind of regret buying because I modified it heavily after getting it. But the Zizo theme does a lot better job and then in the example site, this is kind of what they show uh, your example site should have. So if you're, sometimes you can have multiple languages, all kinds of really cool stuff. And then the full configuration, most of that happens in the config.toml file. And this is your basic configuration. Just go through line by line, add the stuff that you want to add. If you don't want to use like discus here, uh, you can just make sure nothing's there and it should, shouldn't populate it at all for your specific theme. Now, Zizo does it a little differently. They add their own config directory and then it has four different files. I like how modular Zizo did it, where you could have the menus and everything separated out. I just never got around to doing that with this theme modification, as again, I didn't want to mess with it after I got everything set up. Other major things I did over here is the comments. Like you'll notice my comments section. I have a very, very clean comment section compared to all other websites. Most websites use like discuss or they'll use like comento.io. And these have, you know, not very reliable spam filters. And a lot of times you get a lot of just garbage con comments like helpful or uh, I hate your face. You know, it's like the YouTube comments on steroids with no moderation. And even with the spam filters, it just doesn't do a great job. So I use something called utterance bot which is this right here. Uh, someone created a comment section. You could actually attach this to your WordPress website if you wanted and get rid of WordPress's comments. Utterance boxes basically says, hey, it will create an issue for every article and then comments come as a comment on that issue. And then it pipes all that back into your regular website. So it looks really good. And even with like the light theme, I'm gonna blind you for a second. It still looks great. It has a, such a good in integration that 
I love how this all works. So at the end of the day, when I'm reading comments on my website, one, they have to have a GitHub account, which really filters out any bots, or let's just say uh, people that don't use GitHub can't comment on my website, which I'm totally okay with, as that's probably not going to be a high quality comment. So a lot of times I'll come into here and go, oh, I got a new comment. Oh, look at that. That's that's an amazing thing. Great. Uh, I already already replied to that one. Or I might look at this one and go, okay, what's going on here? Hmm. And I could read through this entire comment thread, or if someone has like a junk uh, comment, then you do it. Uh, so this right here, MS, MSMG toolkit links broken. Uh, okay, so I probably need to go through and edit this file. It's good to know. I should probably flag myself and assign it so I know to come back to that. And it's a good way to look at the comments and these other things like this is an actual issue on another repository. but as how can I check my all my website comments? Everything kind of filters into my GitHub and into my workflow, and it just works great. So this video has already gotten way too long. Hopefully, this kind of explains a little bit about my workflow and how you can use Hugo and his static site generation to do really amazing things that no one else can, or they will might need a team of like five or 10 people to do this type of thing, where you can just do it by yourself. I love this. I have so much control and I have so much free time, frankly, uh, because of how quick all this works for me. So with that, let me know your thoughts down below or if you have another one, some people like like Node.js and other static site generators. Uh, let me know about those too, because I'm always curious to see what everyone's using and doing. But for me, static sites with Netlify is like a no brainer. Like people using other stuff, I'm like, oh, that hurts my brain of how much time you're losing, but I get it. Markdown and some of this code stuff is not for everybody, but for someone that's pretty tech savvy, I couldn't imagine using WordPress. I would rather walk over hot coals. <laughs> I just, no, no way I'm doing it. So with that, I'll see you in the next one.